Elkton, Tennessee, a small farming town with an average population of 500 since the 80s. Enter Pete and Pat Bondurant, two hulking 350-pound farm boys that ruled the streets of Elkton. Residents said the Bondurant boys intimidated everyone in their path, doing so in their unofficial uniform of flannel shirts and overalls. In this episode, we'll dive into several grisly murders that landed the twins behind bars on multiple occasions. Welcome to another episode of the Cabinet of Dr. Mystery. I am your host, Dr. Mystery. Did you know I'm utterly insane? Reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. What an excellent day for an exit. Be afraid. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. Whatever you do, don't fall asleep. Today's episode is going to be a little different than what we've done in the past. We're going to dive into some grisly murders, some grisly tales here. I don't know, most podcasts have a gold star or, you know, some sort of identifier that you know, a heavy hitter or a gold star, some sort of identifier that signals that it's a gruesome, grisly, true crime episode. I try to picture what would be in the cabinet. And for me, everything that was in my grandmother's cabinet was these little tins, these little metal tins. Sometimes they were old cookie tins. Sometimes they had weird designs that I wasn't really sure what they were or where they were from. She just picked it up at a yard sale or something. Or maybe my grandmother was a Satanist. I don't really know. But, um... (laughs) <laughs> oh, she would hate it if she <laughs> ever listened to this. She would <laughs> she would lose it if she ever heard me say that. But you look in the cabinet, and in the back of the cabinet are all these dark tins. And my idea is that this is a dark tin episode. We are going to brush off the dust of this dark tin, and we're going to open it, and we're going to see what's inside. And uh, so that's going to be our disclaimer, I guess. This is a dark tin episode. There are going to be uh, grisly tales. There's going to be some grisly murders in, in today's episode. So I have put a few links for mental health information. I know that myself personally, this sort of information and these case studies, they don't really affect me that much. I really find them more intriguing to think about how somebody could go and commit heinous acts of murder so it doesn't really it doesn't really upset me it doesn't really affect me but i know that some people get really empathetic with some people get really empathetic and some people really empathize with the victims in these scenarios so i have put a link in the description for us canada and international mental health advocacy and they are helplines for you the majority of them should be 24/7 some of them are text If you're having any mental health issues, please seek help. There are people that care about you. There are people out there that will help you. Please see the description and please seek help if you need to. Mental health is very important. And I would like to stress that if grisly tales, grisly murders, that sort of thing upsets you, I would say please don't listen to this episode. We will be bringing you a couple more true crimes because I find it interesting and I know there's a lot of people out there that also find these true crimes interesting. So we will be presenting a few more, but we have plenty of other stuff that covers other subjects that is more gentle on the stomach and gentle on the heart. That being said, let's dive right on in to the gruesome, grisly tales of Pete and Pat Bondurant, the Bondurant twins, the big boys, the heavy hitters. Here we go! Our main source today is Murder, Murder by Dr. John White. I also watched a few television series about the Killer Twins, the Killer Siblings programs about the Bondurant boys, but that's not where I'm getting the majority of my information from. The majority of the information is sourced by Murder, Murder by John White. So Hugh, Peter Jr., and Kenneth Patterson Bondurant are their full names, but Hugh goes by Pete, and Kenneth goes by Pat. 
The boys were born on April 4th, 1955 in Memphis, Tennessee. The twins were the first of four children born to Hugh Peter and Sidney Lipcomb Polly Bondurant. I just want to say that the father's name is Hugh Peter Sr., correct? So already, you're already claiming a favorite. Hugh Peter Jr., that's your favorite. That's your favorite son. Did he come out first? I don't know. I'm not really sure. I wasn't there. I didn't deliver these two. But, you know, Hugh and Sidney, you are picking favorites. I wonder how that made Pat feel. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck is your problem? You're going to name him after you? He's going to be Hugh Peter Jr. And I'm Kenneth? The fuck? I digress. Hugh Sr. and Sidney Bondurant were civil service employees in the U.S. Army, which meant the family moved around a lot. Something that I can personally attest to. That fucking sucks. I don't mean any disrespect to military members. I, I respect and honor your service, but fuck the military. Like, as a military brat, fuck the military. Not the military service members, just the military in general. I could go on and on as a military brat moving around every five months. But I won't, because that's enough of me. The identical twins both weighed more than 250 pounds by the time they were in seventh grade. The only way to tell the twins apart was that Pat wore glasses. So it's important to note that the twins' father was rough and loud and bordering on abusive. So that could be part of why they ended up the way that they are. But it, I've had male figures in my life that were assholes and I haven't murdered a bunch of people. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt as well, right? Now, not to fat shame anyone... But these twins were large, so I'm going to keep talking about their size because usually in these true crimes, people don't really talk about the male's figure. It's usually, usually the female is described as, oh, you know, she was sexy and she was so beautiful. Um, but like, you know, it's really unnecessary description about a poor victim or whatever. I think it's important to note their size. I think it's important to note how large these twins were because they used that to their advantage and they used that to intimidate people and eventually they used that to murder uh, people, to dominate over people and control them and it led to people's deaths. So I think it's important to talk about their weight. I'm going to continue to do so and I apologize for anyone who thinks I'm fat shaming them, but uh, you can fuck off. All right, thanks. So the oversized, dominating bullies that ruled the school with fear and intimidation. Pete and Pat had a short fuse, and Pete was prone to unprovoked acts of violence. In Murder Murder, a classmate recalls fearing for his life as Pete beat and choked him. Pete and Pat were inseparable. When Pete would start a fight, Pat would be the one to help him finish it. Their size and unpredictable nature made them a force to be reckoned with. According to one of their classmates, quote, Pete was worse than Pat. Pete put Pat up to things. Try saying that five times fast. Pete put Pat. Pete put Pat. Pete put Pat. Okay, maybe I can do it. Okay, fuck it then. Never mind. It's, it's really easy. You should try it. Just do it right now. I'll give you a second. See? Easy. Pete was a bully an instigator, and Pat just went along because he was his brother. So into their teen years, the boys realized that if they wanted to be popular, especially with women, that they needed a steady supply of drugs. Through their partying and drug use, they became popular in school. So like I said, the boys were inseparable for 18 years until their graduation from high school. Upon graduation, Pete moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, and those around him say he was lost without his twin. So without his twin, Pete started a downward spiral. Drugs, binge drinking, violence, a serious downward spiral. And this is where we get to Pete's first serious brush with the law. In 1975, Pete Bondurant, was convicted of murder and attempted murder in Cincinnati, Ohio. Pete had become acquainted with two men, Roger Sellers and Roger Mills, and Pete stayed with the two men and two young women, Sandy and Carol, at the apartment 
late in the evening of August the 24th. After parting for a few hours, the two women left the apartment to pick up cigarettes and soft drinks at a nearby store, Siggy Run. Gone only a short time, they came back to the apartment to find the door locked from the inside. This was strange, as they had just left, and the door was unlocked when they left, so they knocked repeatedly and had no response. After continuing to knock, Pete Bondurant finally unlocked the door and allowed the women into the apartment. When Pete was standing at the door, one of them recalled him holding a bloody knife and saying something to the effect of, You're next. Looking past Pete into the room, the women saw their boyfriends, the other two men in the apartment, bloody, lying on the couch and the floor. One of the men was asleep when they had left to the store. Both men had suffered several stab wounds, and one was nearly dead. In his recorded statement to police, Bondurant, Pete, described how Sellers and Mills had threatened him, he said that earlier that night they took money and a pocket knife from him and refused to return his property. He told detectives he begged them not to hurt him, and he asked them for the return of his property. Pete also claimed that the men in the apartment were making sexual advances towards him, as if that's a justification for his actions. I love when gay or bi dudes hit on me. I'm not gay, but it's really fucking flattering. It's flattering as fuck. Thanks. That's awesome that you think I'm attractive. Fuck yeah. Pete said that he grabbed an item that was lying around, and he went berserk, as he claims he was fighting for his life. During police interview, he told the detectives, quote, I don't know how the judge is going to take it, but to me it was self-defense. It was either me or them, and my neck is just as precious as anybody else's. Here, Pete is claiming that it was in self-defense that the other men threatened him and gave him no other choice, but the remaining roommates, whom Pete hadn't stabbed or hadn't attacked, told a very different story. 17-year-old Sandy told detectives that Pete Bondurant was playing with a knife a few days before the stabbing and that the others had asked him to put it away. She told the detective that during the time Pete had stayed at the apartment, he had asked Carol to marry him and go away with him. She also described Pete as behaving erratically in the days leading up to the stabbings. Sandy and Carol both said that when they returned to the apartment after leaving to get cigarettes and sodas, the door was locked. After knocking and calling out when Pete finally opened the door, he had the bloody knife in one hand, and he said, you're next. So again, we see the women saying Pete's threatening them with, you're next, right? That's a fucked up thing to hear when someone's holding a bloody knife. Like your your friends, your boyfriend is lying behind him, bloody, soaked in blood, and he says, you're next. It's fucking brutal, man. Roger Mills had died from injuries sustained by the infliction of 46 stab wounds about his chest, neck, and arms. 40 of which were accomplished with a screwdriver, and another 5 or 6 with a knife. Roger Sellers, who had survived the attack, had sustained approximately 40 stab wounds. So he is just going nuts. Like, one of the guys said that he was literally sitting at a table or sitting on a couch, and he just came up and started stabbing him in the back while he was sitting there looking at something. Just randomly came up, didn't say anything to him, just started stabbing him in the back. Pete was sentenced to manslaughter for 7 to 25 years for the murder of Roger Mills, as well as an additional 5 to 15 years for attempted manslaughter in the attack against Roger Sellers. From everything that I looked at, Pete was basically worried that he was going to get convicted of murder and put away for life, so he pleaded to manslaughter, or he worked out a deal where he pleaded to manslaughter. Pete was paroled after serving only five years and 28 days for the death of one man and the attempted murder of the other. He was paroled in part because he was an out-of-state inmate and the prison was overcrowded. Now, theoretically, 
If Pete hadn't served such a short prison term for these murders or attempted murders, then he wouldn't have been able to be free. He wouldn't have been free to participate in the murders of Gwen Duggar, Terry Clark, and Ronnie Gaines. You know, and we'll get into all that in a bit here, but I would think that without Pete, Pat wouldn't have the gall to commit these murders. I think that from the evidence that we're seeing here, or the evidence that I've uncovered, Pat wouldn't ha have gone on to commit these murders. Pat would not have done this without Pete. But, you know, that's a problem with prison overcrowding and stuff. And, I mean, you know, the ha you have that, 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 you have that catch-22. I don't know if I'm using that right. You have that catch-22 where you're letting people go and it's saving you tax dollars and it's letting people be rehabilitated and reformed and it's letting them back into society to change their ways and you know and hopefully they have before they reach that point of being released but you know you're also setting free people who have committed heinous acts when you have short prison terms right you know i'm not a politician and i don't really know a whole lot about prison reform but you'd think that if you're gonna just stab people like you stab two people a combined time a combined total of 80 stabbings between two people one of whom died, the other probably has lifelong injuries. I don't know. I think you should be serving 25, whereas Pete got out in five years. That's crazy. He just went he just went berserk. He just went nuts and started stabbing a bunch of people, and they're like, yeah, we'll put you away for a, a couple years. But yeah, there's too many people here. We'll just let you go. While Pete is in this downward spiral... Pat was actually putting his life in the right direction. He was getting it together. He had a he had a full-time job. He was driving around one day. He was rear-ended by this woman. They exchanged information. And then he married her. He married his wife, Denise. And, you know, that's what I truly think is that Pat was moving down the right direction. He was getting his life together. He was cut, as far as I know... He was cutting back on the drugs and the drinking and the partying, and it seemed like he was actually trying to put his life together, get it going in the right direction. With his wife, Denise, their relationship was a little bit tumultuous. Their tumultuous relationship resulted in them getting, you know, breaking, breaking up and getting back together repeatedly over the years, right? They would break up and they would get back together, and it was just a kind of an endless cycle. After Pete's release from prison... He moved back to Elkton, Tennessee, and moved in with Pat and Denise, against Denise's wishes. Just as a little side note here, when I was reading about this, their house is located across from a strip joint, and it's called the Booby Bungalow. The Booby Bungalow sounds like when I'm with a significant other, and we make a fort that showcases her breasts. Like the Booby Bungalow, seriously. You own a strip club, and you call it the Booby Bungalow? Anyway, we'll move past it, but I was just really, I was, I was really blown away that your name for the strip club that you own is the Booby Bungalow. With this move, the twins reverted back to their former selves, partying, drug use, and binge drinking. Their house once again became the party house, with a steady supply of cocaine, Valium, Dilaudid, and alcohol. With this steady supply of drugs, the Bondurant boys had a Manson-like following of young people who came to Pat's Elkton, Tennessee farmhouse for drugs. Although there was partying, accompanied by a steady flow of drugs and young people, even though everyone was having a good time, Everyone knew not to fuck with the Bondurant boys. I think the twins thought of themselves as drug kingpins, and they sort of hyped themselves up with a bit of a invincibility complex. In May of 1986, Ken Duggar went to the brother's house to retrieve his car which had broken down while he was partying at their house the night before. His sister, 24-year-old Gwen Duggar, drove him back to the farmhouse to work on his car. Upon seeing Gwen, Pete was immediately drawn to her, and he urged her to stay and party with them while they worked on the car. Ken left after fixing his car, 
and Gwen stayed behind to party with the twins. Pat said he would take her home later, but she was never seen again after that night. Over the next few hours, Pete force-fed Gwen an excessive amount of drugs. As Gwen began losing consciousness, the twins took advantage of this and both sexually assaulted Gwen. Pat's wife Denise caught the twins assaulting Gwen and she attempted to help Gwen get up and leave. While Gwen was trying to get up, Pat pushed Denise out of the way and with all of his strength, brought down the handle of the axe on Gwen's head. As Denise was trying to help Gwen up, he came over with this axe handle and he handed it to her. And she looked at him and she said, I don't need that. Why would I need that? She can walk. It's fine. And then he pushed her out of the way and said, fine, I'll do it. And that's when he lifted up the axe handle and he began bludgeoning Gwen again and again and again as Denise watched in horror. Denise, is unable to or too fearful to intervene, watched as the bludgeoning continued. When Pat retreated, Gwen was still alive and breathing. Pete walked over and said he was going to put Gwen out of her misery and shot her with a twenty two caliber pistol in the head twice. The twins forced Gwen to help clean up the blood from the murder scene. They then wrapped Gwen's body in plastic and took her body out to a barrel where they stuffed it in head first and burned her body over the course of multiple days until only ash remained. They took out all the cloths that they used to clean up the blood and they burned all Gwen's belongings with, along with it and any other evidence. Gwen was a single mother with a young boy, so immediately she was reported missing. Ken Duggar even went to the twins' home where they told him she left the house alive and well. With no physical evidence, the case went cold, and Gwen was determined as missing. Fearing for her own safety, Denise remained in the home. Denise and Pat's relationship became even more violent over the next few months. Even though Denise was pregnant with Pat's baby, Pat pushed her on the floor, punched her, choked her, and on multiple occasions held a gun to her head. Just so you get an idea of how fucked up Pat is becoming now that his brother Pete has come back, Pat used to go to work, even at parties he would do this, and he would sit down with a pound of raw hamburger and shovel it into his mouth by the handful just for shock value. Eventually, Denise's sister came to the house and removed her from that terrible, shitty, abusive situation. Pat and Denise's son had cerebral palsy, and although, and although Denise and her son lived at her sister's home, Pat continued to cash disability checks and provide additional support for their son. One month, Pat told Denise he didn't have the child support, or the check as his wallet had been stolen with money and the check inside. Pat was convinced that his drinking buddy, Hippie, had waited until he was inebriated and had stolen from him. Pat had vocally made accusations and even threats against Hippie to their friends and co-workers. On October 17th, 1986, Pat went to Hippie's to play cards. While in the middle of the game, Pat claims he caught hippie cheating and they started fighting. To me, it seems like Pat was really just looking for a fight. So hippie's real name is Ronnie. Ronnie Hippie Gaines. So while at hippie's place, Pat accused hippie of cheating, accused him of stealing, and it started an altercation. Pat grabbed a rocking chair and beat hippie to death with it. He bashed Hippie's head in until nothing but splinters remained of the rocking chair. Pat then took Gaines's body and placed it in the bathtub. He called up his brother, and the two dismembered Hippie's body and cut it into small pieces in the man's bathtub. They cleaned the house of any evidence, even pouring Drano into the drain to remove any further evidence. The Bondurants then burned and buried the pieces of the body across their family's farmland. 
I don't know. To be honest with you, I have a few drinking buddies, and if any of them took my money, I probably wouldn't beat them to death. I would probably just figure it out, you know? I've had people come into my house who are my friends when we're drinking and they take something from me. I don't know whether it's because they're drunk or because they just want to take it, but I'm not going to beat them to death with a chair. I would probably just ask them if they took it, right? Or stop hanging out with them if I didn't trust them. Pete is actively, aggressively being vocal about how he thinks that Gaines or Ronnie Hippie Gaines has stolen from him and ronnie says you know hippie just says come on over bro like it's not a big deal even though you're telling everybody that you're gonna bludgeon me like come on over we'll play some cards and then he kills you yeah he's like yeah he's gonna kill you he's a fucking psycho man doesn't matter if he's your friend if he's telling everyone that he's gonna beat the piss out of you if he's telling everyone that he's gonna come and attack you you know whoever i think one of the quotes i read was like Whoever fucks with the Bond or Aunt Boys is going to get it. You know, you take my money, I'm going to fuck you up. And he's like, come on over, man, let's play cards. Like, what? Anyway, so the boys, the boys clean up after Pat kills him. The boys clean up, and they cut up his body, they burn his body, they bury his body on, on their yard, right? And uh, a few days later, Denise comes by the house for whatever reason. And, you know, they have a kid together, they have, they probably have property that, you know, they have things that they need to still communicate about. So for whatever reason, Denise is there at their house, at the farmhouse, and she pointed out that there was some blood on Pete's car. Instead of denying it, instead of coming up with a story or, you know, telling something to, to, you know, telling Denise something to ease her mind, Pete doesn't deny anything, and he just straight up says the blood was from Hippie. He even pointed out He even pointed out that there was still a small smoldering pit of Hippie's bones. You know, he pointed to the burning pile of Hippie's body. He told her, he told Denise that they needed to introduce some rubber and and other accelerants because they couldn't reach a high enough temperature to fully burn Hippie's body. So he's just, he just doesn't give a fuck. You know, they think they're invincible. Here's another, here's another thing, you know, another incident that shows that these two think that they are invincible, like they cannot be touched. Pete told Denise that Hippie got what was coming to him in reference to the idea that he had stolen money from Pat. Sensing her obvious uneasiness, Pete gave Denise money for her silence, saying she was, quote, entitled to a third of the burial expense. So I'm assuming that this money, like it's meant for her you know, it's meant to bribe her to buy her silence, but this money, I'm assuming, was found on Hippie at the time of death, and Denise also stated that there was some blood on one of the bills, or some of the bills. So I think that this was all money that they got from Hippie after they killed him. The twins were fearful that they would leave evidence that would be eventually found when police were searching for the missing Gaines, the missing Hippie. So they returned to the house to set it ablaze. They set up the time burn using candles and bed sheets so that they could be 10 to 15 minutes away before the fire even began. The boys threatened Denise, telling her that if she didn't remain silent, they would implicate her, and if she was in prison, then she couldn't care for their son. Pat was brought in for questioning as he was the last person seen with Hippie, but his statements checked out, and he was released, and the case went cold. And for the next three years, the police had no leads, no evidence, and no one came forward. Nobody had any information. Nobody wanted to fuck with the Bondurant boys. So after a few years, there was no leads, the cases were cold, but I read that Denise... She was dating a law enforcement officer. So I think I think that Denise was probably a little bit afraid. I think that she was living her life in fear. And even though she wasn't, you know, in the home with the twins or even in the home with Pat, I think that she was still fearful that, you know, she's the last remaining link to the, to the boys with these murders, right? She's the last remaining piece of evidence. 
So I think that Denise was always a little fearful. You know, maybe I'm being a little presumptuous, but I know if I was privy to a murder or privy to multiple murders, I, you know, if I had knowledge of multiple murders that my partner or, you know, my close acquaintances, my brother-in-law, if I had knowledge that they had committed murders, heinous murders, I would probably be a little fearful especially since they're already trying to buy me off, especially since they're telling me that they're going to implicate me in, in the murders, in, in said activities. Yeah, she's probably fearful. So eventually, in 1990, Denise testified against her husband and brother-in-law in exchange for immunity for his, her involvement in the murders and the cover-up. I watched a little bit of Denise's testimony and it's honestly really heartbreaking like it looks from my perspective it looks like she was seriously fearful for her life that she was like disgusted by their actions but she just didn't have anyone to turn to and she had no way out and you know it's a small town it's a like I think the population was around 500 in in the you know around this time the 80s the 90s so it's a really small town you know everyone and, you know, everybody's up in your business and it's, I could only imagine what she was going through. You know, I don't want to sympathize with her too much or empathize with her too much because, you know, she was still involved in the cover up at least, right? There was, there was some steps that she could have taken to change the outcome to maybe even save Gwen's life. But, you know, at the end of the day, she was very distraught that she had to witness these things, much less be involved in them. So, in her testimony, Denise said she watched the brothers rape, torture, and ultimately shoot the young mother before burning her body in a 55-gallon drum and dumping the ashes in a creek near Pat's rented farmhouse near the Shady Lawn truck stop in Elkton, across from the Booby Bungalow. Bow, bow. She also told them what the twins had said to her about Hippie's murder. So Denise took the police around the farmhouse, and when they were spraying luminol around the scene, witnesses said, quote, the room lit up like the night sky. It's like when Dwight and Michael are in the hotel, in uh, the office, and they're, they're in a hotel, and they turn the black lights on, and all they see is like white splatters all over the bed sheets, all over the walls. That's what I imagine, you know. And then they go. He goes, uh, "This is either blood, semen, or urine." And he goes, mm -hmm. "I hope it's urine." Anyway, that's what I think of whenever I read about luminol being used, because you know, a lot of times people will say that quote, "The room lit up like the night sky." Well, you know, I hope it's urine. In this case, it was not urine. Maybe a little bit of urine. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a little bit of urine. Probably urine. But not like all urine, you know? A little urine. A little blood. Well, probably a little semen. Probably not a great scene to be a part of. And I always wonder, can you, like, can just by looking at it, when you spray luminol or you turn on a black light, can you tell the difference between semen, urine, and blood? That would be something interesting to ask a forensic expert like do you know when someone is like just blowing a massive load or if someone took a leak or if someone's just like if that's like a squirt of blood like i imagine you could study the trajectory and you know you could probably figure it out that way but i i'm just curious if you can actually tell just by looking at it let me know cabinet of mystery at gmail.com tell me if forensic experts can tell if you've shot a giant load on your wall. Let me know. Let's see. Let me know. I'm, I'm interested. I'm curious. Let me know. Cabinetofmystery at gmail.com. Fill my inbox with cum, blood, and urine. Indicted in 1990 and on trial in 1991, the twins were ultimately convicted of second-degree murder in the death of Gwen Duggar, and sentenced to 25 years for her murder. Pat was convicted of first-degree murder, and Pete was convicted of helping his brother dismember and burn Gaines's body. 
Pat gets first degree murder and Pete, I don't know, he just gets in trouble because he just helped clean up. I don't know, man. One guy beat him to death with a chair and the other guy helped cut him up into little pieces. I feel like you should both get fucking murder for that. Like, I know that one guy is just coming by afterwards and cleaning up the mess, but like, he cut him to pieces, bro. He literally cut this guy. He They dismembered this fucking guy. Imagine. And then it's just like, yeah, you just kind of helped. No, man, I feel like dismembering is more brutal than, like, bludgeoning someone with a chair. Because you have the nasty smell, right? Like, I've been in a slaughterhouse. I can only imagine what it's like when you when you butcher and dismember a human, right? Anyway, you know, I don't want to make you upset. I don't want to make your your stomach upset or anything. But, like, god damn. I would think that if you're dismembering a body, I would think that you would get more serious charges. But here you have it, I guess. In addition, they were also, of course, charged with arson for burning down Gaines is home. You know, they got a little bit of damage for Hippie, but the serious charges were for uh, Gwen Duggar's death. They got a little bit from Hippie, but because there were only charred remains and no body, the twins received second degree instead of first degree murder. In addition to these convictions, Pete was also suspected in the 1986 murder of Pete's girlfriend, Terry Lynn Clark. While police were investigating the death of Hippie, they came to the farmhouse to ask Pete about Pat's whereabouts, and upon arriving, they found Terry Lynn Clark dead of a drug overdose in Pete's bed. When we do research for these episodes, we do uh, kind of shop around, we look at multiple sources, so we name our major source where we get a lot of our information from, and we, we name sources where you should look if you're interested in further reading, but we do also, we look at multiple sources. So we'll look at a couple different books or a few different articles or a few different news clippings, and we will actually do like a dive and figure out what is the general consensus. Are there things that these people are reporting that other people are not? Is there a way that we can confirm something that we haven't heard at other places? So you know, looking through all of our multiple sources on this, some sources say Pete was convicted and sentenced to 15 years for Terry's death, but if that's true, I don't think he would have been eligible for parole when he was released, because he was released December 21st, 2016, and, you know, I'm not very good at math. I failed every math class I had, but that math doesn't really add up with an extra 15 years on Pete's sentence. My theory about Terry Clark's death is that she was either another victim of a drugged sexual assault that unfortunately ended in her death, or that she threatened to go to the police with some information she had about one of these multiple murders, and, you know, it was made to look like an overdose. Right? We don't really know much about Terry Clark's death. We don't. We don't know much other than she OD'd and she died in her sleep in his bed. That's really all we know. So like I said, Pete was released December 21st, 2016, at I believe 61 years old, after completing his sentence and telling the parole board that he was a changed man they released him. He served all of his time. So he's not actually on parole, he's not on any sort of supervision, he's not being monitored in any way, and there was reports that when he was released, like a, a year or two after, that he had actually started a Facebook profile, and that he was seen smiling in his Facebook profile with his signature uniform of the flannel shirt and the overalls. Pat is still incarcerated, and his release date is 2070. So that is the gruesome, grisly tale of the Bondurant boys and how they landed themselves behind bars, Pete's case, on multiple occasions. That's kind of our first dive into a serious true crime. You know, I, I kind of wanted to lean people into the idea of true crime. I wanted to present a few different episodes 
you know, of different tales from different perspectives that didn't have to do with a serious grisly murder, right? Because I want to, I want to explore different avenues with this podcast. I don't want it to just be about grisly murders. There's enough, there's enough true crime podcasts out there that just focus on grisly violent deaths. And I want to focus more on the mysterious, the unsolved, the unexplained. I want to focus more on the things in our world, in our existence that we question or that the majority of society doesn't question, but they should, right? You know, I, I just want people, I want people to think. I want people to open their minds and, and think about the possibility that the person that you trust is a fucking monster. Because, you know, maybe that's a cynical way of looking at things. Because there's beautiful, wonderful people in this earth, in this earth. And there are so many caring, kind individuals. But there are also fucking monsters like the Bondurant twins, right? And I think it's important that you just keep your, you know, keep an eye on people. And honestly, I think that people should just not trust people in general. You know, you should be, you should be accepting and open and caring and kind to people. But you should trust them only to a certain extent. You should be careful and protect yourself. You know, you don't need to go out of your way and insult others or, you know, put up giant barriers and never let anyone in but it's more about being careful and being mindful that people are not what they say and what better way to end the episode than that this episode is produced by not what we say hosted by myself dr mystery to view more visit us at notwhatwesay.com our Instagram handle at Cabinet of Mystery, or our Twitter at Open the Cabinet. Please leave us a review if you enjoyed the show, and let us know what topics you'd like to hear in the future. You can reach us either on the socials or at Cabinet of Mystery at gmail.com. Once again, thank you so much for listening, and please subscribe for more episodes.